General Fritz Hubert Grosser shouts orders at his tank commanders as they dart forward. An opening has presented itself in the Polish lines, and he is not going to miss this golden opportunity to strike back. The German Panzer Division goes full throttle, pushing their engines to the max. Bombs detonate all over the tanks as artillery rains down from above. The Nazis return fire, causing entire buildings to explode into fiery debris. The Nazis have an important mission. They must stop the advance of the Polish and Soviet forces before they reach Dresden. If they don't, the war will be all but lost, and thousands of German citizens will die. The Red Army is closing in on Berlin from all sides, but if Grosser can stop the Poles and Soviets outside of Bautzen, he will give the German citizens enough time to escape further west. The Nazis have seen what the incoming Soviet forces have done to the surrounding areas. The Red Army has ravaged entire populations of German sympathizers as they made their way toward Berlin. Capture at the hands of France, Britain, and the United States is a much more desirable outcome for many than being left to the mercy of the bloodthirsty Soviets. Grosser believes he can win this battle. If all goes according to plan, he'll even be able to flank Soviet forces heading toward Berlin and might be able to turn the war back in Germany's favor. The tanks continue forward, followed by a wave of infantry. The Germans break the line. None of this would have been possible if it hadn't been for a greedy decision made by General Karol Sreczewski, who was put in charge of the Polish forces. His choices allowed the Nazis to achieve one of their greatest victories near the end of World War II. It may not have jeopardized Allied victory, but it allowed the Nazis to win a battle that decimated Polish forces and bought them some extra time. April 16, 1945 Soviet and Polish troops launch an offensive into Germany. Casualties on both sides grow as forces march forward and approach the Nysa River. German forces put up as much resistance as they can muster in hopes of slowing down the advance from the Eastern Front. Luftwaffe planes fly overhead, dropping bombs on Polish and Soviet forces. Men dive for cover as artillery shells explode all around them. Finally, the Germans are overrun by the Red Army and its allies. They fall back further into the motherland. As they retreat, civilians run from their homes, desperately trying to stay behind the protection of the Nazi forces. However, many are left behind. When the Polish and Soviet forces roll across the Nysa River on April 16th, they either capture or plow through anyone in their path. The race to the next strategic location of the war is on. German forces fall back to the city of Bautzen. It's here that General Fritz Hubert Grosser and his forces will make a final stand. If he plays his cards right, he can use his superior military technology and experienced soldiers to break the enemy line and encircle them. Once he deals with the incoming forces, he can then aid in the defense of Berlin by attacking the flanks of the Red Army. Grosser meets with his commanders in the old fortress of Ortenburg, where they devise a plan of attack. We need to stop the enemy advance or the war will be completely lost, Grosser says to the other Nazis in the room. They discuss how to possibly defeat the 80,000 enemy soldiers and 500 tanks that are barreling toward them. It seems like a lost cause, but Grosser has a plan. He explains that if they remain patient, the enemy will likely make a mistake. He knows that General Swierczewski and his forces are nowhere near as experienced or well-trained as the 50,000 soldiers he commands. On top of the infantry forces, the Nazis also have 300 tanks and 600 artillery and anti-tank guns at their disposal. The Nazis may be outnumbered, but if they remain disciplined and wait for the right opportunity, they can win the battle that's to come. Grosser gives his lieutenants orders and sends them back to their units. He takes a deep breath and examines a map with the most updated information on enemy positions. He is facing the Polish Second Army, and although it's mostly made up of inexperienced men who were enlisted when the Red Army swept through Poland, Grosser knows that they're out for blood. He also needs to worry about incoming Soviet reinforcements from Ukraine that could arrive at any time. They haven't reached his location yet, but when they do, the battle will be much harder to win. Grosser commands the 4th Panzer Army and hopes it'll be enough to at least buy other German forces time to be deployed across the country. Then it happens. Grosser receives word that the enemy forces are approaching fast. It's time to prepare for battle. The Polish 2nd Army and Soviet battalion sit along the border of Bautzen. General Karol Sroshevsky will not hold his troops for long. He desires blood and wants the city of Dresden to bathe in it as retribution for what the Nazis did to his country and people. Other leaders in the Polish 2nd Army warn Swarczewski that Germans are not only cunning but also have powerful weapons that outmatch their own. They should proceed with caution, but all Swarczewski can think about is how badly he wants to take Dresden. The order is given for anyone not able to fight to be evacuated from Bautzen. Supplies are low, but the Nazis will hold out as long as they can. All hope seems lost. Inevitably, it will be either the Polish and Soviet forces who will overrun them or the Western Allies. April 21, 1945 the Battle of Bautzen begins. Polish and Soviet forces split up and spread their line too thin. 
The Nazis realize this fatal error and immediately take advantage of it. The Soviets halt their advance, but the Polish Second Army continues on as Karol Sraszewski urges his troops toward Dresden. It's unclear if this is a miscommunication or if Sraszewski's bloodlust has overtaken him. At the same time, General Sraszewski leaves his artillery and guns behind as his tanks and soldiers advance forward. His thought process might have been that the bulky weapons would only slow him down, but this is a critical mistake. Grosser and the other Nazi leaders realize that either because of inexperience or lack of foresight, Sraszewski is presenting them with the exact opportunity they need. A gap opens up in the Polish Second Army. Some forces are stuck securing the Muskauer Forest region, while others continue on toward Dresden. The Polish forces are spread across 30 miles. There is no way they can reinforce one another if they get into trouble, which is exactly what the Nazis are betting on. The main Polish tank battalion rushes to keep up with the infantry division. It's in transit between the divided forces when the Nazis strike. German troops and tanks are ordered to shoot for the gap and encircle the enemy. The timing couldn't have been better for the Nazis. The 20th Panzer Division along with the 72nd Infantry Division pushed the advancing Polish and Soviet forces back out of the city of Bautzen. During the battle, a key commanding general of the Polish 5th Infantry Division by the name of Aleksander Waszkiewicz is killed. This dealt an early blow to the Polish 5th Infantry Division, as Waszkiewicz was one of the most seasoned generals. With every move that the Germans make, they seem to be weakening the ranks of the Soviet and Polish forces to critical levels. However, as the Nazis reclaim the city and push into the surrounding area, they come across a gruesome sight. A barn blazes in the distance in a small village called Niederkaina, right outside of Bautzen. A unit of Nazi soldiers is sent to secure the town and capture enemy stragglers. When they enter Niederkaina, they're greeted by the horrid smell of burnt hair and flesh. They approach the barn. The smell grows stronger. The fire eventually burns itself out, and the Nazis investigate further. To their horror, the barn contains the remains of around 200 captured German soldiers that were locked in when the building was set ablaze. All of the men inside were burnt to death. War truly does bring out the worst in people, no matter what side you're on. The German 17th Infantry Division advances to the east and decimates misplaced Polish forces. As they push the enemy back, Nazis are able to free trapped German troops along the way. This adds to available infantry, which is vital as every last fighter counts. The 545th Infantry Division proceeds to wedge itself between the two sections of the Polish army, ensuring they can't be unified. They cut off communications between the split Polish forces along with any other Soviet allies that might be coming from the east. Without a unifying set of orders, the invading soldiers are running around like headless chickens. Even as the Nazis encircle and drive Polish forces back, Sraszewski continues on his mad push toward Dresden. This only exacerbates the pressure being put on each of his divisions and leads to some terrible consequences. Leaders in the Polish army are falling left and right. The Nazis use their superior knowledge of warfare to identify weak points in the Polish arm. They cause more and more mayhem and casualties, throwing several of the Polish divisions into disarray. If the Poles and the Soviets don't do something soon, they'll lose their entire force, and Germany will have the ability to launch a counterattack against their armies advancing toward Berlin. The German counteroffensive is initially a huge success. Many Polish and Soviet units are defeated or captured as a result of the quick action taken by Grosser and the other Nazi commanders. To make matters worse for the Poles and Soviets, the Luftwaffe is able to secure air superiority. Most of the Soviet air force is engaged in the bombing and battles over Berlin. So without an answer to the German aircraft, the Polish and Soviet soldiers and tanks in the Battle of Bautzen get decimated. Entire infantry units are mowed down by machine gun fire from strafing planes. The bombers drop their payloads on top of Polish tanks and artillery, obliterating any hope of them counteracting the panzer divisions. It's all-out chaos in the early days of the Battle of Bautzen, and it seems like nothing can stop the Nazis from claiming victory over the Polish Second Army. The German infantry that used to separate the two halves of the Polish army make their way into the Muskauer forest to deal with any enemy stragglers. What they find is astonishing. Hidden in the forest are the remnants of their own forces who held out against the invasion and are still battling to protect Dresden from the Poles and Soviets. The Germans had no idea their comrades were there, and now they've been reinforced. With the unification of multiple divisions of Nazis, they're able to surround a number of Polish units. The result is devastating for the Poles. The 16th Polish Tank Brigade is en route to join the forces pushing east when they come to a stop to assess their situation. Word has reached them that the Nazis have split their forces down the middle. No one can believe that their commanding officers could be so careless and let something like this happen. The forest goes completely silent. The Polish troops look at one another. Something is very wrong. Suddenly gunshots ring out from the tree line. 
a sizable German force steps out with grenades and machine guns that catch the 16th Brigade off guard. Orders to return fire are shouted as soldiers dive for cover and tank commanders desperately try to turn their turrets toward the enemy. However, this new German force was revitalized when they found their comrades held up in the forest. Now their numbers are larger than the Poles had anticipated. The 16th Tank Brigade is given the order to retreat, but there's nowhere to go. They are wedged between the forest and enemy forces. With every moment that goes by, the Nazis collapse in on them. All hope is lost. Nearby, the Polish 5th Infantry Division comes under attack from multiple sides. Enemy soldiers are squeezing them into a tighter and tighter area. There seems to be no choice but to retreat. But when the order is given, the Poles find that there is nowhere to go. The Germans have them surrounded on every side. The Polish forces fall back to where they've set up their headquarters, but the only help they can find is a training battalion. The new recruits shake in fear as the soldiers prepare for an imminent attack. This will be some of the first combat they've seen, and the situation is dire. The only option for the 5th Infantry Division is to break through to the tank brigade and join forces. This will be easier said than done. The inexperienced Polish soldiers try their best to make strategic decisions, but they haven't been trained properly. They move when they shouldn't and sustain heavy casualties. As fighting breaks out in small villages, they get surrounded. Entire units are either slaughtered or captured. Some do manage some success, but the losses far outweigh those who are saved. Out of the 1,300 soldiers in the Polish 5th Infantry Division, it's estimated that only around 100 survive this part of the Battle of Bautzen. Even as his forces crumble around him and the Nazis gain the upper hand, Swarczewski refuses to believe he's losing. His men are dying across the battlefield. His forces are divided by the Germans, and his battalions are under attack from all sides. Yet Swarczewski still sends more of his men toward Dresden, even though this will weaken his position even further. Swarczewski truly believes that this is just a phase and his forces will eventually be able to push the Nazis back. But as the sun rises to its zenith on the second day of the Battle of Bautzen, General Swarczewski realizes how much trouble his forces are in due to his decisions. He orders all his units that have been sent toward Dresden to turn around and return to Bautzen to aid in defense against the advancing German forces. April 22, 1945 The tanks of the Polish 1st Armored Corps reach Bautzen that night. They have no time to waste. As soon as they see muzzle flashes and artillery light up the sky, they engage in battle. Instead of saving the day, the Polish tanks are greeted by German panzers. They are outmaneuvered, and the 1st Armored Corps suffers heavy losses. The Germans continue to advance. The Polish artillery units try desperately to stop the wave of Nazi forces, but to no avail. The artillery has no support from infantry units, as they were separated the day before. The Poles are overrun by German infantry and decimated by the shells from the Nazi tanks. Up to this point, almost all communication has been severed between the multiple Polish and Soviet forces spread across the region. The wedge that the Germans drove down the middle of the 2nd Polish Army exacerbated this problem, but on the evening of April 22nd, communications are restored, and Swarczewski gets in contact with an enraged Marshal Konev. Ivan Konev is Marshal of the Soviet Red Army forces and are advancing across the Eastern Front. He is appalled by the losses that are being sustained at the Battle of Bautzen. Konev informs Swarczewski that eight divisions from the Ukrainian front are on their way to support the Polish army and to reinforce key positions near Bautzen. Konev sends the Soviet 14th and 95th Guards Rifle Division, the 4th Guards Tank Corps, and the 2nd Air Army to aid the Poles in stopping the Nazi advance. April 23, 1945 the sun rises. The Battle of Bautzen has been raging for three straight days. The Germans have decimated the Polish and Soviet forces thus far, even though they were outnumbered and had less resources. They've pushed past the city of Bautzen and are moving further north to aid in defense of Dresden and Berlin. The Polish and Soviet leaders know that this Nazi force must be stopped at all costs, or it'll have dire consequences. The Germans, on the other hand, have no intentions of stopping. They demolish their enemy at every turn. It seems as if nothing can stop them. The Nazis are fueled by the need to protect their Fuhrer and the countrymen from the threats pouring in from the east. They may be losing the war, but there is too much at stake for them to pull back now. The Nazis continue using the same tactics that provided them so much success thus far in the battle. They divide the enemy forces and encircle them, causing massive amounts of casualties. This sends the enemy soldiers into retreat, forcing them to leave behind supplies while the Nazis pick off any stragglers. Even more important is the reunification of German units that have been trapped throughout the region. With each push forward, the Nazis either rescue captured comrades or help alleviate the pressure being put on the German units that have been separated from the main army. The Germans are gaining more soldiers as they continue pushing the Soviet and Polish forces away from Bautzen. This brings them another step closer to aiding the rest of the Nazi forces fighting back the invasion. Hundreds of trapped German soldiers are astonished to find the enemy falling back 
even though they seem vastly outnumbered. It isn't until the Panzers and the Nazi troops roll in that they realize they are winning the battle. As the Nazis push forward, the Soviet and Polish forces try to counterattack. However, each time they attempt to break the German line, they fail. This only bolsters the resolve of the Nazi soldiers. They seem unstoppable, as if some divine power is on their side. In reality, they're just better trained and have a more cohesive command structure that allows them to act quickly and effectively when an opportunity presents itself. The battles between the Germans and the Soviet and Polish forces continue for the next two days. The Germans push their enemy further north and east. Then the Soviets and the Poles launch counterattacks to try to reclaim some ground but fail each time. It seems as if the Germans know their routes of retreat and plan ahead in case of an enemy counterattack. They're taking full advantage of fighting on their home soil. As warfare in villages and the surrounding area continues, the Polish 9th Division is ordered to proceed to Dresden. Little did they know that the German forces are lying in wait along the route. They are ambushed and sustain heavy losses. The unit is given orders to retreat and fall back to join up with the rest of the 2nd Army, but it's too late. They are decimated by the Nazis who are pushing the Polish and Soviet forces further out of Bautzen. This comes to be known as the Valley of Death, where 75% of the 26th Infantry Regiment of the 9th Division is killed. Combat commences in open fields and roadways, then proceeds to towns. Soldiers engage in intense house-to-house -house combat. The Soviets and Polish soldiers barricade themselves within buildings, firing out the windows at anything that moves. The Poles use this tactic to try to hold their positions so the Nazis can't push them further back, but each time it fails. The German forces roll into the towns with their panzers and fire shells into the enemy-held buildings. Anyone who survives the onslaught is greeted by shock troops and seasoned veterans. Whenever the Nazis overtake or defeat an enemy force, they check the bodies of fallen soldiers for any useful info. The Germans find orders detailing the Polish army's plan of attack and escape routes. They use this information to stay one step ahead of their enemy. While the Poles and Soviets think their lines of retreat are clear, the Germans deploy units to wait for them and attack when they move. The Germans go from building to building using grenades to exterminate anyone inside. Few enemies are captured, instead the enemy is executed or left to succumb to their wounds. There's no time to take prisoners in such an aggressive advance. The Nazis claim a great victory between April 21st and the 24th of 1945. They now have complete control of Bautzen, and the Soviet and Polish forces have been pushed back to the point where it seems the Germans will be able to lend support to other divisions in the field. Then it all comes to a screeching halt. The enemy forces entrench themselves in place just as Soviet reinforcements reach the area. With this influx of troops, the break in the Polish-Soviet line is closed, and the Germans can no longer encircle their troops. This is a turning point in the Battle of Bautzen. Until now, the Germans had won pretty much every engagement between the two sides. However, just as the Soviet reinforcements arrive, the Nazis run low on fuel and supplies. Their forward progress is stopped. The Nazi strategy of separating the Polish army, disrupting communications, and encircling enemy divisions worked perfectly until they could no longer fuel their tanks or resupply their men. The Germans were outnumbered, but they were able to overcome the odds. Now they're outnumbered with very little hope of maintaining their victory. April 25, 1945 just as the German forces are brought to a halt, Adolf Hitler sends a message to the leaders of the Nazi forces around Bautzen, congratulating them on their admirable courage and victory over the enemy forces. But this message is premature. The new enemy line that now extends across the entire battlefield is ordered to advance. The Red Army reinforcements, along with re-established communications between the Second Polish Army, allows them to once again march toward Bautzen. When the German forces try to move to the east and find a new route of attack, they're greeted by the Soviet 5th Guards Army, who's just arrived with fresh troops and supplies. The battered German soldiers have finally met their match. They might have stood a chance if they had been well-stocked and hadn't been engaged in non-stop fighting for the last several days, but they aren't that lucky. The Soviet line cannot be broken. The German forces will never reach the flank of the Red Army and aid in the protection of Berlin. The Battle of Bautzen has been won, but the war is quickly being lost. April 28, 1945 the Battle of Bautzen ends. However, there's still continuous fighting as the Germans try to hold out as long as possible, hoping the Western Allied forces reach them before the Soviets barrel through the region. Both sides suffered heavy casualties. So although the Battle of Bautzen is considered the last victory for the Germans in World War II, there was an astounding loss of life. During the battle, the Polish army lost around 18,000 to 25,000 men and over half of their tanks. The Battle of Bautzen is considered by many to be one of the bloodiest battles that the Polish army has ever been in. The Germans suffered far fewer casualties but also had a smaller force. It's likely that the Nazis lost around 6,500 people, although some people think it was much less than that. Ultimately, the Germans won the Battle of Bautzen but did not complete their mission 
of breaking through the Polish and Soviet forces and aiding Berlin. However, they did stop the Polish forces from reaching Dresden before the end of the war, which is also seen as another victory for the Nazis. Their success in taking back and holding Bautzen allowed countless refugees and citizens to flee west and surrender to the Western Allies, who were closing in on Berlin. Now watch the Battle of the Bulge, or check out Hitler's plans for the world if you won.